friends and colleagues. Uh, uh, we are now at our usual appointment uh, with the uh, usual flash mob. Uh, today we have decided to go back to a more hardcore syntax topic. And so tonight we discuss negation, a topic that we find very interesting both from the syntactic but also from the semantic point of view. We have invited as usual two prominent linguists who have worked on this topic. And tonight they are Viviane Defray from Rutgers University and the French CNRS and Hedit Zeilstra from the University of Göttingen. Tonight's moderator is Chiara Gianola from the University of Bologna. I, I think most of you are familiar with the format by now, but I repeat it for those of you who have not attended previous sessions. So as usual, the two discussants will exchange ideas and give us their view in the form of a contest. They will answer three questions offered by the moderator and have five minutes each to give us the answers for each question. At the end, the moderator will summarize and comment the results, and then we open the discussion, which will include questions from both Zoom and from YouTube. For those of you who are on YouTube, please send an email with your question to my address, which is Cecilia Poletto, without dots, at uh, gmail.com. For security reasons, the chat microphone and screen sharing will be disabled during the debate, but the chat will be active at the end for you to write if you intend to ask a question, and we will enable your microphone. Those of you who won't be able to ask their questions can send it to me via email. We will collect them and then post them. The event is being streamed on YouTube and recorded on both YouTube and WeChat. So if you ask a question, you are giving your consent to be streamed and recorded. Please feel free to distribute the link of the YouTube registration to your friends and colleagues uh, and post it on your social media. And now I leave the floor to Chiara Gianola who will moderate tonight's epic battle in linguistic history. Um, can you still, I'm sorry to interrupt, can you still hear me because I can't see anything? Yes. Oh, okay, we can. How, how come I don't see anything? <laughs> That's a good question. So you don't you don't see the puzzle of faces now? No, I see a big thing, Zoom and university. This happened since the jingle. University Delhi Studi di Padova, and that's it. So you Maybe can, you can leave the meeting yeah. and then enter again. That might And then enter help. again, exactly. Just leave the meeting and re-enter. Okay, good idea. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> yeah. just, just please, yeah. no. <laughs> Should I start with the introduction anyway? Oh, okay. 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 Just, I, we can just get out and come in again. No, that's okay. I found it again somehow. I guess okay, great. So, Chiara, you can start now. Wonderful. So, uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you especially to Vivian and uh, to Heather for having accepted our invitation for this linguistic flash mob on negation. So negation is, of course, a subject of everlasting fascination for linguists, and we join into the club together with philosophers and cognitive scientists in this enduring interest. For linguistics, the study of negation has played a key role for the investigation of the interaction between meaning, structure, and form at the level of the clause, but also at the level of nominals. Uh, the cross-linguistic variation in this interaction between uh, levels and connected to, to the dimension of variation, also patterns of linguistic change. The syntax of negation has served as a fundamental testing ground for parametric theories of typological variation and change, but also for optimality-based ones. And, and all this originated a, a very large body of comparative work. And the parameters regulating the expression of negation have been shown uh, to display a complex pattern of interdependencies, restricting theoret in a theoretically relevant way the number of possible types and hence also of possible changes. The empirical domain of negation has uh, also proved useful to explore the feasibility of minimalist approaches that attribute cross-linguistic syntactic diversity to a limited amount of possible variation in the lexicon, a variation that in turn is modeled as the feature of specification of the lexical items involved. Phase theory in turn allowed for an improved understanding of locality conditions regulating the distribution of 
negation and its interaction with other scope taking elements. Evidence coming from the syntax of negation figured prominently in the more general debate on some core aspects of the general architecture of the faculty of language, such as the nature of the agree operation in syntax, the relation between syntax and morphology, uh, between uh, syntax and the semantic component, and uh, prominently the interplay with pragmatics. The three questions that we propose to our debaters today bear on various aspects that concern the interface between structure and meaning. First of all, the relationship between the universality and the uniform logical characterization of the negative operator on the one hand, and its exuberant morphosyntactic manifestations on the other hand, the properties and motivations of negative concord, and the scope interactions with other functional categories. Thanks to the work of the last decades, we have reached a profound understanding of these aspects from an empirical point of view and from the point of view of important theoretical generalizations. Yet, these generalizations are relatively poorly considered when it comes to reaching a general model uh, for the so-called transfer component. So after this very short introduction, uh, uh, well, I hope it was short enough for you because you're uh, obviously want, uh, wanting to listen to our debaters today. And let's move directly to the first question, which uh, we phrase as follows. How does semantic uniformity map into such a broad syntactic uh, variation? And um, I think that Vivian will start on this, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So um, I, I um, want to, if I can, project one slide. Um, so I hope that this will happen. Let's see. Okay. I'm sorry because we're still. <laughs> okay. So. Um, so we are not seeing it, but. Yes. Okay. I'm trying to. Okay. This is not working. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not very conversant in Zoom. We are using a different one. But are now you it's good. Now? Okay. now we can see. And if you wish, you can put the slide on full screen just to read them better. Yes. Okay, so what I wanted to start with is um, just uh, um, as as uh, Kara has said, um, having uh, talking just a little bit about the exuberant um, uh, morphosyntax that uh, we experience in uh, or we can see uh, with uh, negation. So basically, uh, we know that um, negation can have also very exotic forms such that um, you can, um, there are languages in which it's marked by reduplication, languages in, in, in which it's marked by tonal change, languages in, in, which, in which it is marked with the absence of a tense marker. Um, but uh, these are um, rare forms and uh, even though they need to be accounted for, um, they are not the majority. Majority of forms are less uh, diverse in terms of the kinds of uh, morphosyntax that it can uh, display. So we know that um, we can have uh, particles, that's the most common form, and uh, that are invariable, um, that uh, we have affixes and um, mostly suffixes, which is not surprising. And then uh, adverbs, auxiliary verbs, complementizers, and discontinuous negation. So what I've shared here on the screen is, um, so um, the, the other thing that we have is even we, when we have um, um, relatively common forms, uh, in addition, what is striking is that uh, is the diversity of position that these, these different forms can actually take. And uh, so I have uh, put up this um, slide uh, using uh, the uh, structure that has been um, proposed by um, 
um, Cecilia uh, recently in a recent paper, although this comes from work that she has uh, done for a while. And so this is on the top of the structure and you see that um, this is in uh, Northern Italian dialect or Italian dialects more broadly. And then some additional forms come from like German and, um, and um, uh, Irish. Um, but what I wanted to do, because I work in this uh, area, is to show that, so uh, the, 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 the way that uh, um, the various people have arrived at this structure of all those positions in uh, the syntax is by uh, testing uh, mostly the position of um, negation in relation to adverbs, because we all know that uh, the positions of verbs is not a reliable um, um, element. So anyway, what I wanted to uh, show is that in languages in which we don't have such a large diversity or let's more exactly in languages that Memo has uh, said were basically their uh, uh, functional structure on their sleeves, we uh, observe the same amount of uh, variation. And that's what this slide is illustrating. So it's basically uh, the position of uh, negation in Creole languages that you see on this slide. And we can see that um, if I can move something that is in the middle. Okay, yes. Uh, we can see that uh, basically we have um, uh, uh, the position of the uh, uh, the negation can be at the end of the sentence in a number of Creole, including Burbis, Dutch, Sango, and Fadambo. It can be um, in um, pre-VP position in a uh, uh, language like African. Uh, it can be in the pre-generic aspect, uh, namely after the aspect of um, uh, um, anteriority in uh, Reunion Creole and Louisiana Creole, so it's interspersed in the um, 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 TMA uh, pattern. We see here that you have um, the anterior and then the negation and then another aspect which is completive and um, so on. And then uh, you also have um, the most common form which is the pretense form in Haitian Creole, for instance. And then you uh, potentially also find a complementizer form, like uh, for instance, in Tayo, uh, which is a Creole, um, uh, French-based Creole as well, um, you can see um, um, a negation, which is basically at the beginning of the clause, um, which uh, is formed from uh, il n'y a pas sort of a, uh, there is not an existential type of uh, negation and um, an existential and the fusion basically of the an existential ilia and of the negation together. Okay, so this definitely um, illustrates uh, the uh, possible um, um, ver ver variety that we observe and um, what I'm going to uh, talk about this. So this. What, what is interesting um, in recent work by Poletto is that she has shown or um, that uh, the diversity of the positions that we can see actually often uh, ma uh, match the type of etymological origin that they have. So I cannot in illustrate that very well with the Creoles because uh, often, at least in the French-based Creole, all we have is, as a negator is pa, um, but uh, if we just look at Napa, for instance, which is an existential type uh, of negation, it's something like there is at the beginning of the class clause and more exactly there is not, uh, then we see um, that the position is related to uh, the kind of um, uh, negation, um, the kind of position that it would have um, in the um, clause otherwise. Okay. So basically that's, I think, a very interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, discovery. And uh, it uh, leads us to believe that this uh, 
whole uh, slew of possibility uh, cannot just be uh, random. And also that we cannot just decide that uh, we have one position um, in uh, the language and then it uh, takes scope widely. So um, I'm not uh, there. Um, the the uh, uh, solution that has been proposed and that I personally uh, like very much uh, for um, the uh, position of negation or to uh, put together the idea that there is only one negation somewhere, but that we have all these possibilities is to propose that in fact, negation is a complex uh, morphological entity. Uh, and is not just uh, the elements that you're actually seeing, but that it bundles together a bunch of different features and has a complex internal structure. So um, the complex internal structure um, is uh, also, uh, so basically that's what uh, uh, Poletto is proposing and uh, what she is offering as a solution is that we have a very uh, complex um, um, morpheme that is um, generated very low in the structure and that basically checks uh, various po positions um, by um, the regular other features that it contains. So her uh, structure is um, essentially based on um, as you can see, um, uh, types of, of negation that are related in part to nominal uh, projections. And her basic idea is that um, the negation is like a big DP, uh, similar to a big DP or a complex DP, and, um, but in negation form. Um, somewhat different but similar approach um, is proposed by the clerk, which also I find very interesting. And she has the same kind of idea, although in a much more articulated way, um, that the negation is a complex uh, morpheme and that it uh, uh, raises uh, in different positions. Her, her motivation is slightly different uh, or, or at least adds to uh, what um, Poletto has proposed, which is that um, she has observed uh, patterns of syncretism uh, across languages and essentially observed that uh, there are um, no holes in terms of the syncretism. So if you can see on the slide, basically uh, a morphological negation can um, use uh, either one. So you can, there can be several negative marker in a, in the same language or only one. Uh, for instance, in Czech, we have one for all these position, but in Greek, we have uh, one for each of the position, and then the other languages are uh, somewhere in between. So um, the, the view here is that, um, again, we have a complex uh, morpheme and or more exactly a, a complex lexical item that contains several uh, morpheme. And uh, that, um, again, it's generated very low in the tree and that you, I mean, the, the negative um, complex is moving up the tree as much as it does, it is needs to actually uh, uh, reach its um, okay. surface position. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Are you, are you coming close to, to, to concluding your, your answer now? Well, <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, okay, not really, but um, okay. So I'm, I'm, the point that I will, so we, we've talked about this, this uh, situation, uh, the, the, this proposal, which I find uh, very interesting. Um, now the question uh, that, that what has been shown, of course, as well, is that these positions, uh, the positions of the negation in the tree actually do not um, 
um, limit uh, necessarily their scope. So you can have a low uh, negative uh, uh, morpheme and it has a wide scope. And various proposals have been uh, made to account for uh, this fact. Uh, one of the proposal, for instance, is by Moscati, and his um, idea is that you uh, the the negative clause is essentially clause typed, and so whenever you have a marker in a position, it clause types the um, um, whole clause as negative, and uh, it allows uh, then. Um, the marker itself to either, so there is a relationship of agreement that he proposes between uh, the close type of projection and uh, the marker. Although this uh, agreement form does not uh, uh, entail that the um, negation will be raised all the way to uh, the top position. It will be only raised to the position that, um, it has in the syntax, and then it can entertain um, a copy uh, relation with the with higher projections and uh, allow the the scope to be um, going up. So um, I wanted to uh, talk about many other things, but uh, I uh, I think I'm running out out of time. And hopefully, I will uh, go on with other uh, points in the discussion. So I will end here. Right. So we have to keep to the five minutes, uh, as close as possible to the five minute format to leave some space for discussion. Please add the, you have the word, but Viviane, you will have time to, to add things later on, I, I hope. Yes, so let me share my screen as well. Or maybe you have to stop sharing first, Viviane. Do I have, okay, I'll do that if I know how to. Mm -hmm. Okay, now now it's good. Now we see Heather's screen. Yeah, okay. so I'll try to be short, not only because we were only given five minutes, but also because I think there is actually less to say. Um, the question starts out, how does semantic uniformity Met into the broad, such a broad syntactic variation as we attest. And as a starter, I would like to understand what is really meant with semantic uniformity. And semantic uniformity in Vivian's talk already started out suggesting that maybe the meaning of a negation is always all the same. But then she later on suggested that different negative markers may actually have a different internal semantics. But if you look at the clausal level, you might actually wonder whether semantic uniformity uniformity amounts to something like truth conditional equivalence or LF in uh, identity, or maybe just similarity of usage conditions. Uniformity can be interpreted in stronger or weaker ways. And the question itself doesn't clarify it. Um, my point is that I want to say that actually it might be fairly weak. That is the semantic uniformity underlying different types of negative sentences. So for one, sentential negation, which is what we're ultimately discussing here, does not require LF identity. So here are two examples from English and from Hindi. Um, if you look at the two languages, you see that a sentence like nobody went can be expressed in different ways. In English, you have a negative quantifier, nobody applied to a VP went. In Hindi, you have something like an existential subject, somebody or somebody even, depends on how you exactly want to translate it. Um, negation go, where the negation takes go above the subject. And if you look at the different logical forms, what you see is actually that you have different trees. You have the Hindi type where you have a single negation outscoping an existential subject and a predicate. Whereas, and I hope everybody can see it um, because on my screen it might be less clear, um, is that for the English type of LF, you have a negation that first merges or combines with an existential quantifier. And once that is the case, the entire negative quantifier takes a VP, in this case, went or go um, as its complement. So the structure is different, even though the sentences turn out to have the same truth conditions in this case. Now, the question may arise, is it then the case that sentences just need to have the same type of, the same truth conditions in order to convey the same negative meaning 
Well, that doesn't even have to be the case. We know since the work by Ohala that languages vary with respect to the locus of negation, something that Vivian uh, made clear um, in her answer um, as well. Um, here I give a slightly simplified view. That's not because the world is as simple as it is, but just to make the point. Uwala suggested that there's two locations for a NECP, either a position selecting TP or a selecting VP. There may be more, but already, depending on what exactly the semantics is of tense or any other intervening functional projection, the truth conditions of a sentence with a higher negation may actually differ from the truth conditions of sentences with a lower negation. Now, what this tells us is actually that there's just two requirements on the syntax of sentential negation. For one, sentential negation by definition requires that the entire VP is in the scope of negation, which means that wherever the negative particle or marker is, it cannot be lower than the VP level. And also for reasons that actually will become clear in my answer to the third question, negation may not outscope the metric CP. The CP should be the highest level and not outscope by negation, which basically already gives us the domain of variation that we find. Any negative element that can introduce negation in between CP and VP can render a sentence negative, be it ahead of a neck P, be it a phrase of a neck P, be it a negative DP or whatever, that constitutes a domain for crossing basic variation. And that's all, thanks. Thank you, Hede. That was very uh, synthetic and powerful. <laughs> so this allows us to, to take some more time with our second question, uh, which we phrase as follows. Why are negative concord phenomena so widespread? And uh, Vivian will start again. Vivian, you're muted at the moment. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Um, all right, I wanted to again share some uh, slides, but I think that I'm not sure that. Anyway, I mean, the first uh, point that I was, uh, wanted to make is that uh, um, if we uh, look at uh, the type, I mean, the typologist uh, work, uh, the, typo the typologists do not tell us that uh, negative concord is such a widespread phenomenon. Uh, basically, in terms of a widespread phenomenon is um, they say that uh, we have mostly um, languages in which you have a negation that takes scope over uh, regular expressions or indefinites, and that's the most uh, common uh, way to express anything. So you have not uh, a man uh, not left, meaning nobody left or something like that. Nobody left. This is the most common uh, way. And then when we uh, look uh, at other ways, um, negative polarity comes uh, second in terms of the ranking and then only negative uh, concord and then finally uh, negative quantifier. So that's basically what we get uh, from the typologist. But then um, uh, this, um, of course, that's not the case. The typologists are, tend to never look at uh, dialects. And uh, when we look at certain types of languages, uh, um, uh, negative concord is very frequent. And again, if I go back to the Creole languages, uh, that has been uh, said to have uh, to be the most uh, important, uh, one of the characters, characters feature of these uh, language. So, um, what could be the reason that this is frequent? Basically, uh, there's, there's been a number, I mean, there's been two answers that I know of and there may be a lot uh, more. Um, one of them is a matter of, of parsing and, and pragmatics. Basically, when we compare um, negative uh, double negation or negative uh, um, indefinites to uh, negative concord, the speakers don't like to interpret negative um, uh, quantifiers and tend to uh, only interpret one negation if they can. So that's uh, what that could be one uh, reason why um, negative concord uh, is common. Uh, and and uh, in in this respect, um, 
uh, there's evidence from from the the um, experimental um, domain that this is the parsing uh, negation is particularly difficult as well. The second type of explanation that has been given uh, is a historical explanation in that uh, negative concord basically um, um, in a sense is has its uh, own cycle. So we have uh, what is called the quantifier cycle and this uh, quantifier cycle uh, can interact with um, the um, 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 yes person cycle. Okay, um, what um, I wanted to say is maybe, so that's, those are possible explanations as to why uh, we have um, negative concord. And if we go into the realm of the historical, then uh, the question that is raised is, uh, or that we could raise is whether uh, a quantifier cycle is related to the yes person cycle and whether um, uh, negative concord is, is uh, related to um, the uh, doubling of negation. So um, going into uh, this area, what uh, we can say, we can see is, is the, the question that it raises, uh, and is different a little bit from the question that you've asked, is whether uh, what is the cause of uh, the the creation of uh, negative concord? And basically, here there are two uh, uh, opposed, well, at least two opposed views. And in this respect, um, Hedda and I have been uh, opposing the view. <laughs> so uh, the 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 basic idea is that uh, the. Hedy's basic idea is, is simple, similar to uh, Jespersen, and essentially uh, the existence of neg ne negative concord is linked to the type of neg negation marker that we have. And basically, I am simplifying, and I'm sure you will correct me, but there is a correlation between uh, having a head as a, as a uh, negation marker and having a negative concord. Um, and uh, the, the, the other uh, aspect, and so I have actually in my own work called this the uh, outside in uh, kind of, uh, the inside out so, sorry, uh, kind of perspective where it is the, the nature of the um, uh, negation that determines the relationship that uh, is uh, happening uh, with other um, negative, um, um, well, and NCI. And uh, the, the view that I have defended, so I'm not contesting that there is a, a relation between negation and the uh, NCI, obviously, but uh, I think that uh, the, the nature of change, if we take um, historical uh, perspective, uh, is unrelated to uh, the nature of uh, negation. And that uh, what is happening really is has to do with bringing, let's say, the diversity within uh, the uh, negative uh, item, concord items, and uh, try to look at what they have as internal property that determines how they relate to um, the negation. So this is uh, the perspective that I have defended. And I wanted to, this is too quick, of course, but I just wanted to uh, point out one argument, which I have a slide for, but will not take the time to bring up. Uh, and um, basically the predictions of uh, the uh, idea that, that the, negation, the negation type is what determines uh, the uh, the nature of ne negative concord or the appearance of neg negative concord in languages um, predicts that uh, one should have a certain uniformity uh, within languages. And uh, this is challenged by uh, types of data that uh, I've been uh, working on uh, lately, which has to do with the fact that within a single language, 
you actually uh, find a uh, different uh, relation to uh, the negation. So what I mean by that is Hede has proposed, for instance, that another a further uh, uh, property of the negation is what determines the distinction between uh, strict negative concord and uh, non-strict negative concord. And what we uh, observe, so this, this parameter has to be uh, true for a, a, a whole language, but what you observe is that you actually have uh, differences within language in which you have certain elements that uh, have exhibit uh, strict negative concords and others that do not. So that was the slide that maybe later I'll put it up, uh, showing that kind of example. And furthermore, this kind of example uh, show that um, it depends on the position that they occupy. So the position of, uh, that they occupy can either be doubled by negation or not doubled by, that, by negation. And that is also, um, but that's true all, only of certain types of element, but not of others within the very same language. So in other words, we um, see both uh, uh, strict negative concord and non-strict negative concord within the same language with, of course, the same type of negative head. So it seems uh, not uh, to work to be able to, to, to say that it, uh, this actually depends on the nature of the head. So I guess that I would uh, maybe stop here and uh, let Hedy um, the time to respond. Great. Hedda, please go ahead. Yes, thanks so much. And indeed, Vivian started out saying negative concord is not what is typologically the most attested um, type of language. Um, those are the languages actually like I illustrated for Hindi that use a negation and some existential in order to convey uh, meanings that we in English, for instance, use as negative and definite. Um, what I might add is that it doesn't necessarily entail that those languages are not negative concord languages. It crucially depends on how negative concord is defined. And if negative concord involves overt negative elements that at their service position don't, um, that do not appear at their service position in the position where they take semantic scope that might actually already underlie negative concord. But of course, there's more clear examples of negative concord languages. Italian is one. And negative concord languages are indeed much more widespread, surprisingly more widespread than what you could call double negation languages, languages where you have both negative markers and negative quantifiers. And when the two co-occur in a sentence like English, Dutch or German, you get a double negation meaning. And the question is why is negative concord more widespread than double negation? Um, or why are negative concord languages more widespread than double negation languages to be even more precise? Now, Let's just see, for those who may be less familiar with the terminology, negative concord means two elements that can independently induce a semantic negation may jointly yield a single semantic negation. And Italian, because we should talk about the language of our hosts, is typically such a language. The word non in isolation can render a sentence negative. Gianni didn't call is what the Italian example means. A negative indefinite like nessuno can also render a cement, uh, sentence negative, nessuno a telefonato, means nobody called. But surprisingly, the co-occurrence of non and nessuno in Ital Italian doesn't give rise to two semantic negations, but only one. The sentence means nobody called. Now, this makes negative concord very easily learnable. You basically need the three types of cue, cues that you saw before, that the word non independently can give rise to the semantic negation, that the word nessuno or any other negative concord item can do so, and that jointly the two give rise to a single semantic negation. Now, this learnability is not available when it comes to double negation languages, languages like English, Dutch, or German, because in order to learn via cues that a language like English, Dutch, or German is a double negation language, what you need is sentences like nobody saw nobody two clause internal unfocused negative elements jointly giving rise to a double negation language. Now, even linguists, and I'm looking at Larry Horn, but I guess even he wouldn't utter such constructions to their children. 
children in the primary linguistic input don't get sentences that contain multiple negations unfocused in the same clause. Still, children acquiring Dutch, German, and English are perfectly well able to figure out that their language is a double negation language. Now, if it cannot be due to direct cues, the type of evidence has to be more indirect. And already by work by Clark in the 80s, the assumption is there that children start assuming some close relation between a particular form and a particular meaning. That is, if children start out assuming that every negative form, not nobody, etc., has a negative meaning, then already they are in a stage where they would be acquiring a double negation language. And only if there's evidence to the contrary that not every negative form always corresponds to a semantic negation of its own would make children give this up. That is, you acquire a double negation language by not acquiring that a word like not or nobody means not or nobody. Now, this in a way makes double negation inflammable because if there is any kind of mixed input, there cannot, there is no conflicting evidence between negation and negative concord. If a child sometimes hears nesuno or not in isolation, meaning not a nobody, and sometimes in co-occurrence, um, it means just nobody, that means that there is already a negative concord language. That means that you cannot undo the cues for negative concord. Um, negative double negation in that sense cannot be, um, cannot overrule the acquisition process negative concord. That's uh, maybe a boring way to say it. Stan Wigner said it in a much more prosaic way. One lunatic in a village is enough. So the moment there is some cue or a small amount of cues already for negative concord, the language will immediately be acquired as a negative concord language. And then of course, the question is what kind of cues could be there? There's a whole variety of options. It could be language contact between a negative concord and a double negation language that almost inevitably leads to a negative concord language. Um, it could indeed be Jespersen cycle where there are indeed, as Vivian sa says, correlations between the type of negative marker and whether there's negative concord in the language or not. Even if the correlations are water, aren't watershed, it's still the case that a change of the type of negative marker may give rise to a difference in a type of negation system that the language has. Also, grammaticalization itself, negative phrases becoming negative hats, may give rise to all kinds of other effects, including the emergence of negative concord. So the crucial difference when it comes to double negation languages and negative concord languages is in terms of its learnability. One is learnable in a cue-based uh, driven way, uh, the other one is not. Thanks. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Hede. Thank you very much. We come now to the third question. How does negation interact with other operators? So of course we could spend days and months on it, but you will answer in, uh, in five minutes each. And if I'm not wrong, you start, Hede, this time, right? That's right. So I will continue. Um... So how does negation interact with other operators? And for one, um, it's, I think, pretty hard to come up with a kind of linguistic operator or property that does not interact with negation in a particular or intricate way. Um, we know that negation interacts with elocutionary operators in ways that might not be immediately clear to understand, with modals, but also with stands, with aspect, with focus, with definiteness, and what have you. Now, just for illustration, I will only focus on elocutionary operators and modal auxiliaries, but the conclusion that I will converge to will also apply, I think, to all the other examples. Now, one property of negation is that in some languages, actually two thirds of the languages in the world, it doesn't allow simple plain imperatives to be negated. So whereas in, Fran in Spanish, you can just say le uh, to mean read as an, um, Imperative, you cannot negate it in a standard way. No lay is simply ungrammatical. If you want to convey the meaning of a prohibitive in a language like Spanish, you actually have to use a, a subjunctive in combination with a negative marker. Negative imperatives are out and Spanish is by no ways exceptional in that. Now, work by Han already said that this is due to the fact that speech act operators may not be outscoped by negation. Intuitively, that makes perfect sense. 
a negative imperative is still an imperative. Don't sleep means it is imperative that you don't sleep. Um, a negative question, question is a question. A negative assertion is an assertion. And the idea is that more general, though Manfred Kivka has argued against particular implementations of this, is that propositional operators cannot apply to elocutionary material. That is that if some way an elocutionary feature ends up in the C command domain of a negative operator, if it ends up in a position where it is inevitable that it takes go below um, any, any elocutionary material, then the sentence is doomed. So this already tells us why negative imperatives may be prone to be ungrammatical in various languages. But actually, it's not negation to blame. It's the properties of elocutionists uh, that are to blame. Now, similar things may hold for models. Um, in work together by, with Sabini Atridu, and it's also been observed by Vincent Amer, um, it's, yeah, we observe that whereas some models take scope below negation, other models take scope above negation. Mary mustn't leave means it's obligatory that Mary doesn't leave. Mary shouldn't leave means it should be the case that Mary doesn't leave. By contrast, if you have models like can or need, Mary can't leave or Mary needn't leave, both models take scope below negation. And in work by, with Sabine, um, who is actually present here, um, we argued that this is due to the fact that certain models must and should be examples, are actually positive polarity items, elements that by definition cannot take scope below negation, whereas others are not. And then as an additional assumption, we assume that every non-PPI model reconstructs below negation. And again, what we see is that a particular intricate pattern can be solved by assigning particular properties to some models, but not to others. Again, here it is modality to blame and not negation. Both the unexpected interaction between negation and speech act and between negation and modality are due to the special properties of elocutionary uh, operators and particular modal operators. And in a way, the same picture could emerge when you look at the interaction of negation and various other operations. For instance, in the case of TENS and Barbara Partee's famous stove examples. My point that I wanted to make, and maybe that's the answer not only to this question, but to all three questions and also the various questions that will follow in the discussion period, negation is boring. It's <laughs> blunt, it's stupid. There's really nothing special about it. Maybe don't even waste your time on it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, Vivian, please, uh, let's try to keep it to five minutes because it's really close to time for discussion. Thank well, you. Well, actually, uh, it might be under because uh, to tell you the truth, uh, this is not, I mean, either there's too much to say or um, too little, and it's not a domain in which I have uh, uh, done a lot of work. So, but um, there, there is a, a question which I want to relate to uh, negative concord in a sense. Um, before in terms of um, the interaction of uh, negation with, um, um, let's say, the elements in negative concords. And basically, many of us uh, have wanted to say that negative uh, concord elements uh, do have negation in them, uh, at least uh, at some point uh, of the, let's say, quantifier cycle. And um, I think that uh, there are there are I mean Hede in uh, uh, and others have wanted to say that negative quantifiers basically don't exist, and um, that essentially the uh, negation that we see inside the nominal domain, uh, even if it's morphological, is actually not uh, there um, in terms of the uh, um, the logical form. And uh, the central um, argument that has been used for this is uh, was, what is called the scope splitting. And then indeed, uh, scope splitting, splitting are um, disturbing facts. Uh, so um, uh, in, in the sense that uh, they, they show that uh, they has to be a, for a modal uh, sentence, sentences, um, the negation has to be taking scope over the modal and uh, the 
um, uh, indefinite has to basically uh, sit uh, under it. Uh, so the question is how and is it possible to resolve uh, such a, uh, an issue uh, and keep our uh, idea or our desire that uh, the negation can uh, uh, occur in the uh, nominal domain. And um, there has been a number of solutions offered for this. Uh, there's also the idea that, to, just to point out, and I know that uh, you know many people know this problem, but if the negation actually does go out of uh, the nominal domain, we uh, certainly um, uh, expect that it can have scope on uh, over other things than models. And one thing that is um, pre pretty resistant to this uh, result is that um, it's hard to have scope uh, a negation inside uh, an NCI like Persan, for instance, scope over a universal quantifier like TUS, even though uh, in French, normally um, the negation in the sentence is actually having uh, the favor reading of a sentence with uh, um, a negation and uh, uh, universal scope in the subject position in French at least is the wide scope negation over the quantifier. So that, that is a problem for the uh, uh, scope splitting um, issue, which I am not sure has been um, totally uh, resolved, but there has been um, offered a uh, solution in terms of um, the, um, uh, the, the scope split issue which um, maybe, uh, um, well, they're fairly similar. I mean, there, I know of two uh, um, accounts that are fairly similar. One, or have something in common, let's put it that way. Um, one is uh, by Arenga and uh, Kennedy, and basically assuming that um, the uh, scope, uh, the no is actually, uh, um, not uh, quantifying over individuals, but rather of degrees. And by having this possibility, although I cannot go through the, the whole idea at this point, but having this possibility, you can basically uh, capture the scope uh, uh, splitting uh, view, uh, the, the scope splitting problem uh, in a way that doesn't allow, doesn't uh, enforce uh, splitting uh, the actual negation from uh, the quantifier. And uh, something very similar has been offered uh, by Collins and Postal as well in a recent paper, uh, well, not that, but um, where in which they are saying that you have a, a silent number uh, um, um, element inside the um, uh, NCI and it is that um, at that element that allows um, the uh, uh, the scope. I mean, the the split scope to be resolved. And so um, the question is still uh, there. Um, and and uh, I have nothing additional to uh, uh, offer. Uh, except that now there are solutions to keep the idea that uh, negation can be within the nominal domain. And um, well, <laughs> the, there's more, I guess, to work on this. There's also quite a number of evidence, well, there is evidence that within the NCI sometimes you do have um, degree kind of uh, um, um, uh, semantics or at least elements and so I or that they function up to a certain point uh, like numeral elements so this is what I will and I will stop here <laughs> essentially thank you Vivian that was really great thank you both uh, well my task is now to, to summarize as shortly as possible uh, what uh, I think was uh, was were the main points in uh, in the very rich debate that uh, you presented us with, and then uh, there will be time for questions. So, uh, if you wish, um, start um, telling us in the chat that you would like to ask a question. So, as for the first question concerning the relationship between uh, 
semantic uniformity and syntactic variation, well, basically, we ended up uh, uh, questioning the presupposition itself of this, uh, of this question uh, concerning the, the semantic uh, uh, uniformity. Of course, the uh, a negative operator per se has um, a, a uniform logical representation, but as we heard, uh, th there is no need to have a, a uniform logical um, form in order to obtain sentential negation. And this was uh, Hedda's point, Vivian's point, connected uh, very much to uh, the broad uh, morphosyntactic variation, connecting it to, to form and position of the negative marker, and showing that also in that case, we have uh, cues to assume that actually the negative marker is a bundle of, of, of different semantic features. And so we shouldn't assume uniformity there either. As for the second question concerning negative concord phenomena and uh, the fact that they are widespread across languages, again, uh, we questioned this, this presupposition in the sense that, as Vivian said, uh, it is uh, the, the most frequent types are those where simple unmarked indefinites or MPIs co occur with, uh, with negation. But then Hedda said, well, it depends on how you define negative concord and uh, how do you deal with non-negatively marked uh, indefinites, which I think is, um, is very interesting. And um, as for the um, reason, of the advantage that negative concord clearly has over double negation, at least, then a number of, of um, proposals were, were discussed. Um, and um, there were uh, facts relating to uh, parsing, facts relating to the way language change proceeds, and also facts uh, connected to learnability and in turn language change. Concerning the very last question, the interaction of negation with other operators, had a focus mainly on uh, uh, illocutionary operators and, uh, and models. He told us that negation is very boring in this respect and that all the job of cross-linguistic variation is done by the other guys. Um, and Vivian um, focused mostly on, on the nominal domain and she pointed to uh, the uh, very intense debate uh, concerning split scope facts, uh, uh, which would be evidence against or for the presence of a negative operator within the nominal domain. And she pointed to some thorny evidence that we will have to deal with. Okay, so um, that was my, my summary. I hope I didn't forget uh, something very, very important. And now I am sifting through the uh, to the questions. Um, so I have Raffaele Zanuttini as the first person who booked a question in the oh. chat. Please, Thank you. Hi. Thank you for the talks. I was only able to log in half an hour late because of my class, but I, I really enjoyed it. I have a question, a comment on negation and imperatives. Or first of all, a question is, of course, I don't think negation is boring at all. <laughs> but I took that as a joke. But I also think we can't just simply say that the problem with negative imperatives is that negation cannot outscope the um, elocutionary operator. First of all, Han's proposal has to say something about all the cases of uh, suppletive imperatives that are possible, right? In the languages where negation is high, an imperative in the suppletive form still have the elocutionary force of a command, right? It, it is a justive or a directive, uh, has directive force, it's negative. And so Han says, well, in that case, it's the pragmatics, right? It, it, she, she gives up on the syntax and has to invoke the pragmatic domain. So that account is, you know, has that major problem. The other thing is that we know that the form of negation does have an impact on whether an imperative can be negated or not. We can't just pretend that it doesn't, right? Um, the pre-verbal -ne pre negative markers that are ahead are incompatible, the other ones are compatible. So I thought that that was um, just not fair to negation. Negation is not boring and B, we cannot reduce the ban on negative imperatives to simply the locutionary force. Just to add one thing, that also requires you to make an assumption that force is encoded in some operator. And there are people like me and Paul Porter and others who have been arguing for many years that that's not a necessarily a, a good assumption. 
the force of a clause might arise from the interaction of the syntactic components, not from just a head with certain elocutionary features. Anyway, I'll stop. Yeah, I think this was more addressed to me than to Vivian, so I'll take the liberty yes, of answering. Yes. Of course, there's various questions with Han's approach or any of the successors. Um, of course, you're completely right that the type of negative marker really makes a difference. However, that yes. is compatible if you assume that what underlies imperative is raising of a verb is an imperative feature, and that given a head movement constraint, an imperative verb cannot raise across a negative head, but it could raise across a negative phrasal element. Um, also, you need to say that indeed something like a negative subjunctive, which you use as a prohibitive in Spanish, are not negative imperatives in a semantic sense. They may at best be used with the intentional. Uh, but they have the force of an, they are, right? I mean, the sentential force is clear. Well, the question is how do you detect um, elocutionary force? And is elocutionary force always present? Um, already in the logical form of a sentence. There's this huge debate, well, you know more about it than me, also with Paul Porton's position, um, who argues that imperatives actually denote properties, Kaufmann's positions, that they're actually models of some sort. Um, and it doesn't even have to be the case that everything that is used as a command must always or must always not be encoded as such in a logical form. It could be that for some constructions like true imperatives, um, they are encoded as such in a logical form, but for other... Um, yeah, but that's what I meant. Then you end up having to stipulate that some imperatives have an elocutionary force operators and others don't. Um, right, then, so you need then... to see whether that correlates with other properties. Otherwise, it would be a stipulation. Right. Whereas if you look at the negative marker and then you look, focus on the form of the negative marker, I think you get further with fewer stipulations. Well, I think the negative marker story is fully compatible with Han's story. So there's... Uh, not a question, but the question is like, how do you assign a meaning to a neg negated subjunctive in a language like Spanish? There's a question. Right, 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 right. Okay, I'll let other people comment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Vivian, do you want to comment? Um, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's go on. I have a question uh, by Maria Teresa Guasti. Uh, I think I, I should read it, or do you want to, to ask yourself, uh, Teresa? I, it's not a question. It's just a remark that was made also in the chat by Ken Wexler. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is evidence that children in negative uh, start with a negative concord language, even in English. Uh, it's an experiment by Moscati and Thornton on the comprehension of double negation as, in fact, negative concord in English. And also there is, uh, I think, an edoctical evidence uh, on the production of negative concord by English-speaking uh, children. And I recently also um, uh, heard uh, a, an experiment uh, of a miniature language uh, with adults uh, in which uh, adults uh, guess a, leg a negative con when they have two, two negation in a sentence uh, that is uh, in a miniature language that they have learned, uh, they uh, start with the negative concord interpretation rather than double negation. So it would be interesting to know when is double negation uh, uh, acquired in English now, because as far as I know, there is no evidence uh, for uh, uh, this acquisition uh, at, uh, well, we know that adults have it, but when does it come in the, in the development? I don't know. I, I just wanted to point out that also a uh, recent experiment by Blanchette have shown that even in speakers that actually do not uh, who say that they don't uh, have negative concord, um, there is evidence that they are mastering the grammar of negative concord in the language without actually using uh, negative concord ever. So the question is whether, yeah, you ever reset the parameter and uh, whether there is such a thing. So that's, uh, I think that's a good point that you're making, um, Teresa. If I may add to that, I think the problem is not that problematic, actually, because the question is, how can it be that English acquiring children 
go through a negative congruent phase? And the answer is very simple. English is indeed a negative congruent language, albeit of a particular kind. Um, looking more closely, what you see actually is that English and apostrophe T, the shortened negative form, is, something, is a negative marker that doesn't coincide with a semantic interpretation, which means that depending on your framework, you have to assume some kind of a relation between the position where uh, negation comes from and the surface position of NT. I assume that to be a syntactic agree relation, just as is present in every other negative concord language. The only difference for me is that ne English is a ne negative concord language in which not every negative element participates. Most crucially, negative quantifiers in English, unlike other languages, don't participate in it. It has a hybrid system that I think can be historically explained, but that English learning children go through negative concord phase is actually rather something you rather predict than don't expect. Good. So I, I am following the, the order of the chat. There's a question by Samuel Timothy. Do you want to ask it yourself? All right. Um, thank you very much for um, um, the time. Uh, I'm trying to ask uh, whether there is a correlation between a uh, distance between um, negation and um, pronouns. I, I'm working in a language in which it is very difficult to differentiate between uh, negations and um, uh, pronouns. And in some instances, uh, the negation and the pronouns uh, undergo um, phonological processes such as uh, nasalization, which seem as if the negation and the pronouns are working hand in hand. But in other cases, such as imperative constructions, uh, it seems as if uh, some of the phonological processes are happening within the negation and the pronoun. So uh, I'm a bit confused uh, uh, which is to take. Is it that the negations are different from the pronouns or the pronouns are different from the negations? Thank you very much. So just uh, very briefly, I think that this point is actually uh, reinforcing, let's say the view that uh, uh, Paletto is trying to push that uh, negation has more than one uh, um, element. It's in it, whatever, um, uh, uh, in, in the particle, whatever element that actually represents it. And uh, so that, that's all I can say. And, and uh, I mean, her, her uh, view is precisely that um, negation has a internal structure and that uh, you, un you end up with something resembling uh, critting doubling. And so it's similar to pronoun in terms of its syntax, but not. Um, so that's one thing that is um, useful to look at. Yeah, I would love to see the data. It sounds very interesting. I don't have much specific about to say it here, but what I think more in general, and this is something that I would actually like to make anyways, is that I've never argued that negation cannot appear uh, DP internally. Also for the cases of um, split scope, um, I'm always attributed to the idea that the negative indefinite in a language like German agrees with a higher COVID operator, but actually I've never claimed that. Um, and I think there's other ways to derive those reasons. I think the point is indeed that negation can appear in much more, many more positions than just where we tend to see it in mostly in European or related languages, namely somewhere above EP or TP. The crucial thing is where is the negation itself? Where does it end up in a logical form? And how can you then compositionally get a reading um, that a negative sentence has? And only when you have that, you can de deduce what exactly the semantic contribution is that the negative marker itself makes. So for that, you need to see, okay, what is the meaning of the negation, but also what is the meaning of the pronoun? What is all the what are the meanings of all the other elements it combines with, etc. Great, thank you. I think uh, Pierre Larivé is on now. Yes, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's a brief question with possibly a long answer. Why is it that negation and possibly questions are involved in scope and, and concord relations, at least negation, but not other categories like articles or prepositions typically? Uh, any thoughts on that interesting property of negation? Oh, yes, go for it. <laughs> well, if I may, I think you find these kinds of concord or doubling effects all over the place. So if you look at the <laughs> of tense, there are sequence of tense which I think you can 
um, analyze um, almost analogously. There are things like modal concord, things like the students must obligatorily register themselves, which is again a concord phenomenon, even though I think that you should analyze it in different ways. Um, there's recent uh, work in the thesis that was recently defended in Paris that distributionality shows concord effects. There's concord effects with definiteness um, where multiple definite markers only give rise to the semantics of one definite. Um, it depends a little bit on how far you want to go, whether subject doubling is also an instance of concord. Um, but I think there's many more phenomena that actually uh, show these kind of concord effects. Negative concord is maybe one of the most prominent uh, of those because the meanings become totally opposite, whereas in other cases, like modal concord, you need to have more elaborated diagnostics to really show that there's only one semantically only one model present instead of two. But I think if you look closely at language, you find them all over the place. Actually, the claim that I tend to defend in other work is you can only acquire a particular syntactic category if there are doubling or concord effects with, related, with respect to that category. So then I'm forced to say it goes with every category there is, at least functional category. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So just a, a, a small point, I mean, I think that what you're saying is one way, I mean, there's, there's maybe a confusion between negative concord and negative doubling. I mean, clearly ne negative doubling actually does not ever lead to double uh, uh, negation interpretation. That is just not possible. No and pa are never, you know, in, I mean, and I'm even no in pi is of course no is is depleted, but even in languages in where, where you have more lively uh, doubling, uh, where each of the elements is actually um, um, has has more meat than no, uh, you you don't get uh, uh, doubling. And so in this regard, I think that you are you know correct with respect to negative doubling, but I'm not sure that I would uh, actually want to put negative doubling in ne negative concord, or at least the interpretation of two um, um, NCI together in the same uh, um, boat. Because in these cases, uh, at least when we don't have doubling uh, uh, involved, when we only have what is called negative spread, or when we have also what is called negative, negative spread, then we do have a uh, double negation reading. And in this case, the situation is somewhat different than just uh, basically a, a, a repeat in morpho morphology uh, all over, so. Great. Thank you, Vivian. Since uh, Elena Benedicto had to leave, I will move to Larry Horn's question. Yeah, I uh, actually, uh was hoping for some clarification, uh, a couple of points relating to uh, Hedda's uh, presentation. Uh, Vivian mentioned uh, Blanchette's recent work on um, uh, standard English speaking children going through a uh, stage in which they are capable of making the same kind of judgments uh, on negative Concord constructions that say uh, standard Italian uh, children and adults do. Uh, and one particular aspect of that is the uh, variation uh, between uh, strict and um, uh, non-strict concord. So it's much more likely that children uh, will interpret, um, I didn't see nobody as negative concord than nobody didn't see me, which is of course the facts that had to, you put up for Italian and uh, in, in languages around the world, of course, we have both strict and non-strict um, uh, languages. The non-strict ones always work in the same direction that the post-verbal, uh, uh, the post-sentential negation cases are more likely to be uh, uh, negative concord and the pre-sentential uh, negation cases are more likely to be double negation. Uh, maybe only double negation as in standard Italian, maybe there's a preference as in other cases. And even among dialects of English, as Ingram points out, you have both uh, strict and non-strict um, 
non-standard dialects. Uh, so I'm wondering how parsing explanations really deal with that. So that's the first part. And then uh, the second part is, again, in terms of variation, um, if it's really a fact about the modals and their interaction with negation, why again do you get variation uh, within specific modals like um, it may, he may not leave being either uh, wide scope negation or wide scope modal uh, where it's a root or deontic modal, but it may not rain as only, uh, the, the epistemic reading is only uh, wide scope um, modal and not wide scope negation. Uh, do you simply multiply the kinds of negations? Uh, in British English, you get uh, it mightn't rain, uh, where that's clearly sensational negation. In, in American English, you only get it might not rain, where that's only constituent negation. So how do we deal with all of those kinds of variations if we say this is a fact not about negation or the interaction of negation with modality, but only a fact about modality? So I think those two questions sort of go together. <laughs> yeah, I think they were addressed to me, so I'll... Well, I don't know because I, I think I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, um, doubling versus um, um, the, the negative spread because I think, I mean, the, the facts that you uh, mentioned, namely that uh, there is no uh, real parallel between um, um, the, 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 the uh, I mean, the negation and an MCI and then the the interaction of two NCIs together, where only uh, the, the latter uh, permits double negation and the uh, former is very rare. Um, uh, that, that's- well, what we're talking about nobody saw nobody. I was talking about nobody didn't see me versus I didn't see nobody. Right, uh, right. But that's, that's, that's still the case with the cases that I'm talking about. So okay. I didn't say, I didn't see nobody versus nobody saw nobody. Um, you, you don't have double negation in cases of I didn't see nobody um, very often or never. And uh, in, in, in the cases in Italian are, are very clear. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that you don't you don't see uh, double negation in these cases. So that that there is a, a difference when the negation is one uh, the, one of the negation is just a negative marker and when the other, um, I, I know, but I, I was talking specifically about the nobody didn't see me, not the nobody saw nobody. So in both cases, there is a negative quantifier and sentential negation. The only difference is whether the um, negative quantifier proceeds or follows the sentential negation. And that's, uh, you know, that, so that's just the case of strict versus non-strict negative concord. I'm not talking about negative spread, which I right, agree. Right. With. So I, I wanted to I wanted to come to an, a strict negative concord as well because, like I said, I think that I didn't uh, present these data very well. But the the difference between strict and non-strict, at least, uh, it is not clear in. in there, it's not clear that you have languages that uh, have th that divide. You also have languages that have the divide inside the language. So classifying them as such. Uh, mm. doesn't actually um, um, work. <laughs> that's that's uh, just one point that I wanted to make. And then I want to leave, let Hede answer your modal uh, question, so I won't uh, take. Okay, well, I will also say a little bit about strict versus non-strict negative concrete language, because indeed I've argued that it's a, not a property of a language, whether it's a strict or a non-strict negative concrete language. Uh, that is strict versus non-strict negative concrete is not a property of a language, but it is a property of a particular negative marker. And therefore it should be encoded in the features that underlie the different negative markers. Right. I've argued that in plain strict negative concrete languages, negative markers are semantically non-negative, whereas in non-strict negative concrete languages, they are semantically negative, but nothing forbids a system where you have multiple negative markers, some being semantically negative, Others being non semantic. Oh, negative. Then coming to Larry's point, why would there be this tendency that, yeah, first negative marker, then negative indefinite would give more rise to negative concrete interpretations rather than the reverse? I think, even though it is not watershed, I mean, West Flemish is a language where the mirror image holds. Negative quantifier, negative marker, 
uh, can have a negative concord reading, negative marker, negative quantifier, only gives rise to double negation readings. Um, the reason is that in the learning algorithm that I alluded to, children start out assuming that a negative marker is semantically negative unless there is evidence to the contrary. That means that in the acquisitional process, whenever the child hypothesizes that there's a negative concord, it should first hypothesize that it's a strict negative concord system, sorry, it's a non-strict negative concord system and only later reanalyze things as a strict negative concord system. And that would explain this inbuilt preference for languages, especially where the status for negative concord and double negation is not far from clear, that there might again be a preference for non-strict negative concord configurations over strict negative concord configurations. So I think this is inbuilt and it ultimately reduces to learnability. Then about the models. I had that, can I, sorry, interrupt you because we are running really late. So I just wanted to ask Ken Wexler if he wants to add something about the comment he wrote on this topic in the chat, just not to interrupt the flow. Sure. Okay. I, since I wrote it, I think a few people have commented on the horn, but I don't think it's been resolved exactly. If I under, and I'm not sure I understand um, Teresa's comments completely. I mean, I was making the suggestion, which I thought maybe Teresa said that even in languages, or Larry, in which there's no negative concord at all on the input, say standard English, okay? Um, kids, see, there seems to be evidence that kids fairly readily invent negative concord acquisition. I think Larry made some points similar to that. Um, if, if, if that's so, how would Hedda's argument exactly work because it, it really doesn't depend upon um, having any examples of it. Now, if the argument is supposed to be that you interpret um, any instance of double negation, the kids, I mean, interpret double negation as negative concord, instantly assume negative concord, um, that could be an interesting idea and we would relate to Vivian's point that it's because negation is so difficult um, she says processing is actually conceptually, especially double negation is conceptually extremely oh, difficult, even for exactly. adults in many cases. And for kids, it's probably very difficult. So what you have to assume then, but then let's work it through though, all of it. If, if it's double, if, if, if one instance of, how, ma how many instances of double negation does a kid hear? Not all that many probably, but he has a lot of instances of non-concord. Um, I don't want any. Um, I don't want any book. They hear thousands of ice cream. You can't have any such and such. Okay, so you're hearing thousands of instances like that, and you hear one instance of double negation. He doesn't want no book, meaning double double negation, meaning not negative concord, meaning right. Um, he doesn't want no book. In fact, he wants some book. Um, okay. So are we going to assume that that one instance of double negation misinterpreted is going to tell the kid it's fine to have negative concord? I'm not so sure, maybe, um, but it's a little difficult also um, with respect to the question of um, where the kids use semantic evidence of the form of quantifier scope and so on um, with respect to setting, you know, figuring out whether these languages have some characteristics. Usually the problem is sort of is you don't want to think about too much of those things. You want more syntactic, epistemologically available evidence. So one really has to think that through. I don't know what the answer is, actually. Um, um, I'd actually rather a deep answer than, than a learnability answer where some tiny little piece of evidence that's completely misinterpreted is used to set something that's going on. Especially when you, especially when you add to it the fact that most speakers of standard English, if they hear standard English, don't wind up with a negative concord language. Okay, how does that happen? Is it beaten out of them? In other words, they do what we just said and then you, you know, it's, it's, it's all a teaching mode. So you need a lot of negative evidence. You need people instructing them and so on. And how plausible is that given that we know about the lack of a lot of negative evidence? It's possible. So I don't know what the answer is, unfortunately, but I'm just not so sure that these answers can be so easily given. We would need a lot more depth to it, a lot more argument about how it actually works. But it's, um, what really gets me is, is the problem 
that's been put forth? Why is it so readily and why do kids make that mistake so often when it isn't in their input? I agree that that's a really interesting question. So. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm sorry, so Hede, you, you're clearly not right. The negation is very interesting and fascinating. <laughs> we can't stop the discussion. Uh, can you just close with one sentence on models and then I leave the floor to Cecilia for the announcement. Okay, so I said about the models that um, if a model is a BPI, it outscopes above negation, at least in languages like English, otherwise it scopes below. Of course, that's not the complete answer because the question immediately arises, what makes some elements a modal element? And for existential models, I've argued that what makes them PPI-like is obligatory existential import of the domain of quantification. That is uh, the existence of a possible world that is part of their modal base. Now, if you have, in English, it's indeed the case that deontic or root may receives a reading taking scope below negation, whereas epistemic may outscopes negation. But if the condition that every uses of may must give rise to the uh, required existential import, then if you were to, then there's a difference between deontic and epistemic may. Um, she may not leave, is perfectly compatible with there are worlds in which she, um, actually where she does leave. So there are worlds of the kind, they're only not part of the intersection of the circumstantial modal base with the worlds that I consider the best worlds. But she may not be in the office, cannot take scope below negation because then you get a contradiction. Because I would be committed to the existence of worlds in which she is in the office. And I would at the same time assert that there are no such worlds. So looking at the property that makes existential uh, models, PPIs or not, actually predicts that you get a deontic um, epistemic or root versus epistemic shift of the kind. So I think it rather supports the view that here models are to blame, but I'm very much willing to concede to Chiara, indeed negation is interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, I cannot tell you, well, let's discuss further during the coffee break. That's not that kind of setting. I just have to close it here. Thank you very much. It's been a really extremely interesting. Uh, Cecilia has an announcement to make and then we will close. Non ti sentiamo, Cecilia. Thank you, everybody. As usual, this is the announcement for the next uh, uh, interesting, uh, hope, hopefully interesting uh, flash mob. The next speakers are Richard Kane and Adam Neleman. They will be talking about linearization on the 12th of November, always at 6.30 p.m. Central European time. I hope to see you all soon. Uh, the, and I would like just to mention another initiative that we are starting. There is a, um, a vlog related to the linguistic flash mob. So if you have interesting questions or interesting answer to post on the blog, you're very well welcome to do that. And as usual, you know, with the last slide that uh, you see the organizational committee uh, and our graphic artists and all the rest of the people who have been helping us. See you all on the 12th, uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invite. Thank you all for the comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Heide, thank you, Vivian. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. Bye, ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao, Memo. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao, Andrea. Ciao, Memo. Ciao, ragazzi. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. 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 How are you? I'm going to give you an answer. Ciao, Vivian. Ciao. Go ahead. I'm not sure where the coffee break is. No, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna leave. It's you have to hang up. <laughs> I could just close the chat, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. 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 bye.